and I'll get right into it. We don't have that much time, and this is a massive subject that we could spend. I know all of you will have some good ideas as well, and I hope we can have a, a fruitful dialogue. I'll just start right up where John left off. You know, we're all, those of us basically who are in higher education, from whatever angle, whether we are students or professors or project managers, probably don't need to be convinced about the transformative power of higher education. Uh, we believe this, and this is why we work for free, because uh, we believe uh, that the cause needs no further justification. Unfortunately, however, uh, both governments and, I must say, private foundations uh, who uh, will grant funds for supporting people, particularly in, uh, through international scholarships, do require some sort of justification uh, and some sort of uh, demonstration of impact. And I know that with my colleagues at the ACU and at USAID and at the World Bank and at other private foundations, we have been having basically not one conversation but an ongoing dialogue about how do we measure impact. And so what I want to talk to you today uh, about is not so much how we measure impact but how we define it. What are we really looking for in terms of this transformative effect of access to education, particularly higher education that we all, we all have experienced ourselves, we know about it, uh, but find it uh, very challenging to get our hands around it. And so I want to share with you today some of my thoughts on this subject based on my very long experience with this program funded by the Ford Foundation that John mentioned. Um, as you may know, uh, maybe some of you have seen, the British Council and the German Academic Exchange Service uh, just recently published a report about uh, assessment of student mobility scholarship programs. It's quite an interesting report. I recommend it to you. And their major conclusion was that uh, there are many, many of these nationally funded programs. They found them, almost 200 of them, in over half the world's countries, uh, which is kind of astonishing. But at the, on the other hand, and that indicates that governments around the world, particularly in either emerging economies or in developing countries, feel that scholarships are critical and therefore study uh, particularly overseas uh, in the United States, in the UK, in other Western countries, is uh, critical for national development and advancement. Uh, but the other conclusion of the report was that there are massive failures to actually document the impact of these expenditures. So it seems a bit contradictory. On one hand, you have governments putting increasing amounts of resources into scholarship programs. On the other hand, you have a kind of continuing failure to really maximize the returns on that investment. Um, and what I find quite interesting about this is that uh, I think it gives us an opportunity uh, to question not only the mechanics of these sorts of programs and the uh, kind of methodological issues involved in evaluation, how you track alumni, what you measure, how you determine whether it was the fellowship per se that actually produced a desired result. That's the uh, kind of operational discussion we read a lot about. But what I want to put on the table and what my own research based on the program I ran for more than a decade really raises the question of, well, what about this rationale for international study, particularly seen from the perspective of developing countries who are investing, as we see, more and more public funds in these kinds of programs? Uh, do they, in fact, promote national development? And what is meant by national development? And I think what I would like to get out of this conversation and other work that I've done is, uh, is to stimulate what I think of as a broader and deeper conversation about the objectives and outcomes of international scholarship programs, whether they are government funded or funded by 
um, private uh, organizations, as was our case. So that's where I'm coming from. I think we're at an interesting juncture. The number of outwardly mobile international students has almost doubled in the last 10 years. It will continue to increase. Uh, and yet we uh, are not yet there in terms of a dialogue about what is really the uh, purpose of international study, particularly as seen from the perspective of developing countries, where I have spent most of my career. So I want to share with you a program which, as John mentioned, uh, we uh, had the luxury of uh, a very large uh, amount of money from the Ford Foundation. How many of you have heard of the Ford Foundation? You know about it? It's good. It's a big building in New York. Uh, it's one of the uh, traditional U.S. foundations. It used to be for decades it was the largest in terms of both its professional staff, its field offices around the world, and its endowment. It, it, the funds were originally contributed by Henry Ford, of course. It was his fortune. Uh, but uh, the foundation now has its own endowment. and has to, according to the rules imposed by the Internal Revenue Service of the United States, spend a certain amount of the earnings on that endowment. So the Ford Foundation, uh, long since overshadowed by Mr. Gates and his fortune, nonetheless has been around for about 75 years. And this project, uh, it was called the Ford Foundation's International Fellowships Program, or IFP for short, uh, was the largest single investment ever made by the Ford Foundation. The total investment in the program was $340 million. Uh, and as I was explaining to David before, since we received all the money up front, we were able to invest the interest earnings, which meant that the total expenditure on this program was somewhere north of $425 million. It was a big chunk and probably the largest investment in international education ever made by a private foundation. And what was interesting about that sum of money was that, sure, we had those resources. Uh, on the other hand, we had an enormous responsibility to say that if we were going to try something experimental, try to focus a program on people who truly did not have other opportunities, whom we expected would make returns to their society in a very important way, then we had to deliver. Because if you couldn't uh, operate and you couldn't take risks and do an experimental design and implement it correctly, with that level of funding, you never would be able to do it. So we, we felt a very large responsibility to the profession as a whole. So I want to share with you a little bit about the design of the program and the outcomes. and how I think this is important for the larger question about what should, in the end, be the purpose of international scholarship programs. So this is a great picture here uh, of some of my uh, fellows from Mexico. In Mexico, this, this program operated in 22 different countries, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, and in Mexico, we worked exclusively with indigenous students, people who self-described as indigenous. They were speakers of uh, indigenous languages. They came from largely rural areas of the country. And our program in Mexico was the first postgraduate program or graduate level program for indigenous students in the history of Mexico. So it was much more visible uh, than ordinarily uh, otherwise it would have been. They're very happy here because they're celebrating the end of the program and the fact that they've all successfully gotten their degrees. So this, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly identify each of these fellows has a story, and I can't tell you all of the stories, but this wonderful young man here is a South African actor, actually, who is uh, being Othello here in this particular uh, picture. And uh, I just use this as a backdrop to uh, tell you something about the objectives and the features of this program. Uh, as, um, as we laid it out, the objective here was to benefit people from marginalized and excluded communities. We did not have a single definition of what that meant. This was not an affirmative action program as we would have defined it in the US, for example. 
uh, we felt that that definition needed to be developed by people in their own respective countries. But objective number one was to broaden access to higher education, particularly international education, which as we know is a, a very elite enterprise. That in itself wasn't enough. We also felt that most of the policy discussion and policy measures around broadening access to higher education, particularly at the international level, focus on entry and the entry point. What are the conditions for entry? And we felt it was absolutely critical to also focus on what we called retention and success. So we didn't want to set people up for failure. We wanted to create the conditions for their success. And then we had yet another uh, objective in this program, which was we wanted to be able to work with people who had a track record as development practitioners, however that was defined, as community activists, as really militants and advocates in their respective social movements. Because we felt if we focus the program on people with that profile, the higher education opportunity would then enable them to go back and make that direct contribution to their communities. So the program really was looking at social inclusion and development in two ways. One, by broadening access to higher education, which in itself is a social justice outcome. And then secondly, through what we hoped would be a multiplier effect when these people actually uh, returned home. I mentioned the um, level of funding. This enabled us to support more than 4,000 fellows, 22 countries around the globe. What was unique about the program also was that people were not required to study in the US. This is a great uh, advantage of not, have, of not having government funds. Uh, where you are typically required to study in the, in the country that is the source of the funds because those funds come from taxpayers. Uh, we'd like to see some benefit to local institutions. Uh, because we were privately funded, we could say, well, you know, guess what? Newsflash, this was, uh, this was interesting to people that we worked with. Not everyone speaks English. Uh, and so, in fact, in the, at the end of the day, we had our students in about... Uh, 50 different countries around the world, uh, including in their home countries, because for a Brazilian indigenous person to come from the Amazon and study in Sao Paulo was actually a longer journey than to go to Miami. Uh, and so we were very sensitive to the uh, kind of global geography. We felt that it was very important to intervene at the master's level because it was that first postgraduate degree that was very problematic for people. Uh, there were plenty of university graduates, uh, but getting to the more specialized formation, which was also going to be more important for them as professionals, uh, was really the obstacle. We also felt that we had to have some PhDs because uh, in the end, uh, universities need to be viable institutions in developing countries. Uh, and uh, many uh, government jobs also require uh, research credentials. And perhaps most importantly, and uh, we can talk about this in more detail, uh, what was interesting about the program was as, as, uh, as wonderful as myself and my team were sitting in New York, uh, we could not possibly have managed this entire program from New York. And so what we did was work with several dozen organizations, local organizations, who in effect became the sub-grantees for the program. So we re-granted a portion of the Ford Foundation funds for these organizations around the world. And they, in turn, worked with local uh, organizations. So just to give you an idea of uh, how we succeeded here, uh, first of all, it was an article of, it was really just a, a question of policy. We were always looking for gender parity. We realized that in some cases, Latin America, for example, women actually outnumber men in higher education, uh, but at the global level of the program, we were looking for equity. So we did, in fact, at the end of the day, have 50% uh, women in the program. We had a 97% completion rate in terms of people who completed their fellowships in good standing, uh, a 90% degree attainment rate. 
uh, and a 82% return rate with almost everyone else uh, still studying or uh, working in international organizations or in other parts of their region or other parts of the world. So that's the kind of schematic of the results. And what we found very interesting and important in that uh, set of results was that these figures compare favorably or in some cases uh, even uh, uh, somewhat better than standard fellowship programs. We like to compare ourselves to the World Bank Joint Japan Fellowship Program, also very development oriented but very elite. Uh, and so the fact that our fellows were able to complete their degrees, complete their fellowships, and return home, that was the basic narrative. And uh, if we had just wanted to be a conventional fellowship program with a different kind of a client, as it were, I could stop my talk right here. That would have been the end of the story. But we were also interested in what we thought of as ripple effects, other development impacts. So we're looking, and this is part of my research now, on uh, at were there ways in which our programs actually affected other programs, government supported programs, that would have the same objective of expanding access and equity in higher education. We were also interested in building local capacity in scholarship management uh, so that US organizations or international organizations didn't need to concentrate all this work in Western capitals, but could actually, programs could actually be effectively administered uh, in Kenya or in Vietnam. This is now more common than it was when we started this program. And then in particular, and I think this is the most gripping part of the story, we were interested in fellows themselves and what they were going to do with the education, you know, and basically we needed to test, and we're still testing as this unfolds, was the theory right that if you work with people who are themselves from marginalized communities, think of the indigenous people in Mexico or Muslim women from northern Ghana, for example, or religious minorities in India, linguistic minorities in Indonesia, these were the kinds of people that we were working with and uh, people who were proven activists, researchers in some cases, uh, were they going to then, what would they actually not so much do with their education? That would be obvious that they had benefited from it, but how would they, in their hands-on development practice work, change the world? That's what we were mostly interested in. So I'm gonna just give you now a little flavor of what I mean. This uh, handsome young gentleman here is um, a fellow called Rafael Obonya. He's a Kenyan. And I want to play, he's now an advisor to the UN Habitat Youth Advisory Board. And I just want to play you two minutes from a talk. I apologize, the, the sound is okay, the image, it might be a little dark, uh, uh, in which he uh, was talking about his view of social action. And I love this clip because it really gives you an idea of the kind of development leader we were looking for. Because I always, want to make, I always wanted to make Korogosho a place I could call home. You know, growing up, and you, every time you tell someone you're from Korogosho, they get a little concerned because they feel something is not going right here. And that is home. I wanted to, be, to make it a place I could call home, a place that I could go back to, a place that I could be proud to say, oh, just like someone from Runda or Muthaiga would be happy to say, I come from Muthaiga. I also wanted, I al always wanted to say, I come from Korogosho, and people will be proud of that. And so growing up, I saw people coming to Korogosho to witness poverty, to see insecurity, to see crime. I mean, every time uh, there was a flash about Korogosho news, it was always about negative things. A lot of negativity was used to define Korogosho. And so my challenge, and uh, my, my, in my thinking, I always wanted to make it a story that people will come to Korogosho to see more positive things. And after going to the university, when other, most of my colleagues and comrades went to auditing firms, because I did Bachelor of Commerce uh, Finance, they went to auditing firms, others went to corporates, I told myself I have a responsibility. Because like I told you, I was born and brought up and I've been a beneficiary of goodness of people. I've been supported by people throughout. I told myself, I've got to do something. I can go to an auditing farm. I can get a good job, put on a tie every day. But that will just be for me. Perhaps 
there's a way I can go back to Korogosho and make a difference for other young people. And I went back to Korogosho after graduating from, uh, from university, and we founded different organizations there. Uh, if you've ever heard of Ms. Korogosho, uh, uh, that supports girls' education and empowerment program, which was also to change, I mean, to portray the beauty of the people of Korogosho so they see themselves, this greatness, this beauty uh, we, 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 uh, within us. We founded the first community ghetto radio, Coach FM, uh, to, to empower our people. And after that, it spurred a lot of uh, uh, emergence of other, 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 other youth groups and organizations. And young people started organizing themselves to do something for their community because they felt we have ability, we have power. We, mi we might be in a very poor neighborhood, but there's something that we, 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 we can do. And that's the story of uh, many young people growing up in these kind of situations. Young people trying to get out of, uh, out of poverty. Chinu Achebe, one of the great African uh, writers, the late, says in one of his memorable quotes that if you don't like someone's story, write your own. But I think I can flip that to say if you don't like the way people are telling your story, tell it yourself or write your own story. I don't know if you could grasp that Korogocho, for those of you who know Kenya, is one of the largest slums in the world. It's a slum area outside of, right outside of Nairobi. And this fellow is from that area. And basically what I like so much about this quote, I can, I can send you the link, it's actually a YouTube video, is that he's saying, uh, look, if you don't like what people say about you, if you don't like the narrative that poverty is defeatist and we're all victims, then change it, write your own story. And that is, I think, one of the major themes that comes out of my research on following up on these various fellows, regardless of where they're from. There's a, a sense of empowerment, hence the title, Empowering Education, that as educators we all recognize. But it has special resonance for people who are coming out of these situations, the largest urban slum in East Africa, for example to say uh, we're not victims, we are not passive, we can transfer, we can translate our knowledge into action. And that is a common theme. I'm finding that a sentiment expressed and perhaps underlined, underscored uh, by all of these fellows, whether they're from Chile or Ghana or Vietnam or Indonesia. It's really a very striking phenomenon. So, as we think about education empowering people, which we do, uh, in this kind of context where uh, they are typically surrounded by negativity, as Raphael was saying, that makes an enormous difference and it's very inspiring to others. So what I'm doing and have been doing at Oxford over the last year is uh, trying to uh, follow up on the lives of some of these fellows. This beautiful lady, by the way, is a performance artist from Bahia in Brazil. Uh, because I believe that the fellows, our fellows in this program, form a, a natural pool of very educated people. They're strongly committed social change agents. We know that. That's why we selected them. Uh, and therefore, they're a very valuable resource for information and analysis about how a new generation of social justice leaders really perceives uh, the challenges around them. Uh, I'm comparing, I have uh, several dozen of these what I call leadership narratives, and I'm looking for uh, the main themes. And this empowerment theme is really a critical one. I'm also looking to see whether we can identify some common approaches to the way in which they approach development practice. Uh, and I'm particularly interested, and this is coming uh, out in a much more salient way than I had imagined before I started, uh, that education itself becomes a very important transformative elephant, element, not only for the fellows having experienced access to high quality programs, but for the people and the communities that they work with. So I'm going to uh, skip over this and just tell you, give you a little flavor of one of the case studies so you get an idea of where these people are and what are they doing. This is an absolutely, uh, I don't know if uh, some of you may know this region of South Africa. It's called the Wild Coast. Has anyone ever heard of this, been there? 
Yes, good. It's in the Eastern Cape. Uh, it's a very beautiful landscape. It's also a tragically poor area. Uh, this is in the old uh, Republic of Transkei, what was called the Transkei, uh, which was a very deprived area in the, uh, under the apartheid era. So my fellow here, Rajan Woodruff is her name. Uh, she actually did her master's here in development economics at, at, at Sussex. And uh, she and her husband have started this very innovative rural development project. I visited, it, it's 10 hours from, the, from Umtata, which is the nearest uh, airport, over something that if you closed your eyes and really dreamed, you might consider a road, uh, but not really. Uh, and what they have here is, you can see in these uh, little round houses, they have a visitor's lodge, um, which is the for-profit part of the enterprise, and then they have something called an incubator, which is an NGO that they started uh, particularly to work on primary education. So this just gives you some idea of what this uh, area is like. Uh, it's in deep rural South Africa. It's almost all uh, black African residents uh, and a very high percentage of young people. There's almost no industry uh, or even employment opportunities here. Most of uh, the men actually uh, leave as migrants to work in uh, the mines elsewhere and other occupations elsewhere in the country. And this just gives you some idea of what the uh, social indicators are. Uh, essentially an extremely, uh, extremely poor uh, area with virtually no social services, uh, a very, uh, very poor access to education, health, uh, or any kind of uh, sanitation. Uh, it's an inc incredibly beautiful place, uh, but it's also a very uh, tragic place in the sense of rural poverty uh, and how devastating it can be. And uh, as I mentioned, in 2004, uh, this fellow and her husband started this lodge, and the lodge is already owned 40% by the community, and the eventual goal is to transfer ownership uh, to the community. Uh, and it is fair trade accredited. They make a, a, big, uh, a big point of uh, working with uh, the local community residences, residents to create uh, micro enterprises and businesses and in, in effect have a completely different model of tourism than uh, what you see conventionally. Uh, and then in 2007, uh, this incubator or NGO uh, was started. So. What I found most interesting about this case and what they're actually doing is they've, uh, after being in the area for 10 years, this is not just a quick visit, uh, they've been there since 2004, uh, what they have really settled on in terms of the NGO uh, work is education. Even though Rajan herself is an economist, uh, they are not necessarily, she's not a, an educator per se, but she sees that uh, the focus should really be for breaking this intergenerational cycle of poverty. The research very clearly shows you that early childhood education, that is uh, age three to six, uh, pre-primary education is the most effective intervention. And so uh, she uh, and others who work with her have actually begun uh, a very interesting set of uh, preschools uh, that they have founded in, in this region that has absolutely, had absolutely nothing. I'll show you, this is a picture of what the primary school in the area looked like. In, in effect, it did not exist. And so what they've been able to put on the ground in this 10 year time is a very interesting holistic approach to rural development. Uh, working on education, the preschools that I imagine, they actually have rebuilt now this primary school, they have an after school program, they have library facilities, uh, and they have trained dozens of ECD, early childhood development practitioners, from the local community, people who had no training, no education themselves. So this is really about hands-on community empowerment. They also realized that education was great, but if they had no uh, nutritional emphasis, if they had no health services, if there were no uh, uh, 
reliable water sources, and most important, if there was no hope for a sustainable livelihood among these villagers, uh, then the best preschool in the world wasn't going to be able to survive. So their program is a very holistic, integrated approach uh, to rural development, and it has been enormously successful. This is about a... Um, it's about a $50,000 a year enterprise, and uh, most of the funds are raised externally. They have very sophisticated kind of fundraising operations. You can click and donate. Uh, and what I find interesting about this whole project is uh, the many ways in which the fellow's research skills have been used. She is an economist. She's interested in economic development. Uh, in which the community has been empowered both through the formation of local businesses and also through uh, training uh, and education for uh, both the children and the adults, uh, and the ways in which they feel that rural poverty, even though it uh, seems so hopeless, particularly educating young children, is, so, is a focus that uh, awakens hope in people. And a lot of the development literature will tell you about the importance of aspirations. So when people feel that they have a better future possible for their children, they are motivated uh, to work further. And uh, Rajan herself, I interviewed her as part of this study. Uh, what she says about her personal journey is interesting. Uh, I asked her, you know, okay, so in the end, what difference did yeah, that lovely degree from Sussex make uh, to you. And she said, you know, she had a background in finance. She, she is South African, but she's not from this region. Uh, she said, just like the fellow in the video, that she could have put on the equivalent for women, I guess, of a, of a tie and a coat, uh, gone to work in the local finance uh, world and made, probably made quite a lot of money with her foreign degree. But what she thought was important uh, was to make a difference for her country. And yet she didn't really quite know how to do that. So she said that the time at Sussex, of course, provided her with knowledge and skills and a degree and a credential, but also allowed her to envision her own reality from a different perspective and gave her a, a kind of, a, a, uh, showed her that other avenues were possible. So I thought that was a really interesting sort of empirical evidence of the transformative effect of this time uh, abroad. So I have much more to say about this case. Uh, that here you see some teachers working with the children. This is Rajan herself, you can see. Uh, with, and, and they have uh, ultimately uh, built schools in three or four of these communities. So there are now hundreds of children who are benefiting uh, from this intervention. And in my study, and I won't go into it in detail, uh, I try to analyze what are the implications of this case for, uh, for development. And I think the biggest takeaway, aside from the uh, impact of education and the importance of educational strategies, is the fact that Rajan and her husband and others that they work with have been there for 10 years. Development just can't happen from one day to the next. And that sounds so obvious, but try to say that to the people in Washington. You know, It's uh, the development industry, the aid industry, is organized on a completely different principle. And it's typically about external experts who uh, fly in, fly out, leave their expertise, and then wonder why their projects don't work and why there, are not, uh, why there isn't community ownership. So this is a perspective from the inside, sort of the inside outside, which makes it very interesting because here's a, a South African who knows the conditions of this region, but she's not from there. And even uh, Raphael, whom you saw earlier, he left. He studied in the United States, but he went back. So there's something about that transiting effect and the ability to see your own situation with fresh eyes that is very important. Just very quickly, uh, I, I uh, would like to uh, wrap this up, give you some idea of some of the other profiles and portraits and who these people are. This lovely lady here is called uh, Agnes Zani. She's a Kenyan um, who uh, she did her DPhil at Oxford. 
so I, I feel kind of particularly close to her. Uh, she uh, came from, uh, comes from a very poor region uh, in the coastal area of Kenya, uh, in the, where Mombasa is the capital, but in a poorer area of that, an area where uh, very high illiteracy rates, where women in particular are subject to early marriages and uh, other practices that make it very difficult for them to pursue any kind of education. She, uh, her parents were educators, so even though she was from this area, she had some mobility opportunities. She studied, she was a lecturer at the University of Nairobi for many years. Uh, and then after she came back from her studies at Oxford, she got very involved in politics. And the, the really interesting part of the story, this was just a few years ago, last year, in fact, she was, you know, in the Kenyan elections recently, they, uh, there was a quota set aside for women. And uh, she, Agnes, was one of 18 nominated women senators. Uh, she was nominated by the ODM, the Orange Democratic Movement, which is uh, um, uh, the party of the opposition right now uh, in Kenya. So she found her métier because I'm sure she was a great sociology lecturer, but she is now an amazing advocate for uh, girls' and women's rights. And she's pretty good at politics, too, because she ran this year for uh, secretary general of the party. And if Odinga wins or is able to come into power at some point, I predict I give her five to ten years before we see her in some really high elected office. And what's interesting here, you know, we went from Rajan in a kind of NGO loan operation way out there, ten ten hours away from the nearest road, making a difference to somebody who's working in national party politics, uh, who will also have a great influence. And so the takeaway from that is that development leadership uh, uh, propelled by an educational opportunity like the chance to earn a DPhil from Oxford uh, can really happen from many different platforms. And uh, so I think Agnes's story is also a wonderful one. Uh, you were probably wondering, was I ever going to get to any men? So uh, here we have my friend uh, Kennedy, and the Brazilian uh, is, they always call them by their middle names, he's called Kennedy. Uh, he is an indigenous person from Acre, which is in the western part of the Amazon. Um, Kennedy has an interesting story. He didn't go to school until he was 10 years old. Uh, because he didn't know Portuguese. And this is very rare in Brazil. There are very few indigenous people. They actually have a joke that they're more anthropologists than indigenous people in Brazil. Uh, and, uh, but he did, and all of you educators know that late entry into education uh, can really uh, be the kiss of death for uh, a, a career. Well, just last week, or a few weeks ago, when I was interviewing Kennedy, I was speaking to him uh, in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. And I said to him, uh, and the reason he was in Bloomington, Indiana, was because he had just successfully defended his doctoral dissertation. So he's now Dr. Kennedy de Souza. And what makes him particularly interesting, aside from this own personal trajectory, is he lives in, the part, in a part of the Amazon uh, that for the last 20 years has had government set aside conservation reserves. This was a big victory of social movements in the region. Uh, and it's therefore a, an amazing natural laboratory to work uh, out what should be the right balance between conservation, saving the rainforest, and uh, economic activity that actually enable local people to have decent livelihoods. So he wrote a dissertation on what they call non-timber forest products, uh, meaning Brazil nuts, rubber, uh, fruits, medicinal herbs, cosmetics, all kinds of things uh, that people are using uh, to uh, increase their livelihoods. He tells me that he's, he has worked now for 20 years in this area. Now he has even more expertise uh, because he went all the way through a doctorate uh, precisely on these questions of conservation and development. And he says that his, he has worked with over 9,000 families uh, in this region. So if you want impact, this is it. 
He started also, just to show you the primacy of education in this strategy, he started uh, a university that he calls Universidad de Floresta, or University of the Forest. And all these people here are indigenous students from the area who now have a university program that he runs for them. So I think, you know, we, we can't probably drill down to this level for all 4,000 recipients. But if we get back to the original framing question of the talk, what, it, what is impact? What constitutes impact? I think we really have to look much deeper uh, than uh, simply someone going home. The issue is what do they do when they're there and what kinds of impacts do they have on the lives of, uh, of others. So for me, demonstrating impact means demonstrating that people whom you have supported at some cost over a, a relatively long period of time will be able to uh, pass that benefit along to others in whatever way they're going to do that. Uh, and the final example I have here is my friend Minu, uh, just to show you that I'm not totally Latin America and Africa centric. We also had many, many fellows from the Asia region. Uh, Minu is um, an, an Indian uh, woman. She is from Rajasthan. And uh, she actually is not from, uh, we had many of our fellows from India who were Dalits, uh, people from uh, other, uh, uh, what they call uh, other scheduled tribes and the so-called backward castes and people who were really from uh, tribal peoples, marginalized areas. I Mino, mean, no, not so, uh, but her marginalization came from the fact that she uh, had polio as a child and has uh, motor disability. And this category of marginalization, of uh, physical disability, was something that we hadn't even considered when we started this Ford program. Uh, and yet we realized that in so many cases, disability was not an issue, a medical issue. It was a civil rights issue. Uh, and so we worked with a number of people who, like Mino, uh, became very, very strong advocates uh, for disability rights. And I just wanted to tell you about her trajectory because uh, she said uh, she studied uh, with our fellowship for two years at the University of Chicago. Uh, and the U.S. in this regard is quite advanced. There are some very good programs in disability, not only assistive technology, but in um, uh, actual disability rights, uh, which are based on American legislation. And she said basically a whole new world opened up to her, a world of accessibility. And she said she realized that she had been a mediocre student her whole life because she'd spent all of her effort getting around. And when that was uh, taken care of for her, she could really excel, as she did. So just to show you another platform from how to have uh, an impact, Minu is now uh, the uh, head of disability policy and human resources at a company, uh, an IT company in Bangalore called Emphasis, which is majority owned by Hewlett Packard. It is a $1 billion company. It became number seven, the number seven IT company in India. So she has an enormous platform now. And under her watch, some 400 people with disabilities were hired. But she went beyond the individual. She's now changed the hiring practices. She's now uh, almost single-handedly uh, also changed the view that uh, which is the basis of most discrimination, that disabled people are incapable of gainful employment. Uh, and she's won many awards, including a major award that was given to her by the president of India. So uh, again, visibility, different kind of platform, not a politician, an advocate, but working even in the private sector. Uh, not too many of our fellows are there, but I think it, it opens our view of what is development and what are development impacts. So just to conclude, I just want to show you very, very quickly, two more minutes. Um, we also, I said at the beginning, we were also looking for uh, impacts on other programs. And uh, these examples all come from Latin America. We have one from Peru, though for the non-Spanish speakers, this means closing the gaps in higher education. This is a program called Beca 18. 18 refers to the age of people when they get this scholarship. This is a program for undergraduates 
They've given 2,000, I mean, 8,000 scholarships in two years. Uh, this is one of the major social policy programs of the current government in Peru. And the idea is to uh, focus on uh, young people from disadvantaged areas, uh, particularly rural, rural areas, indigenous areas. Uh, and the whole design for this program, 8,000 scholarships later, was based on the IFP model. And I know that for a fact because the person that designed this program was our director for 10 years. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that the Ford Foundation feels very happy about uh, when you see these innovations being picked up. And just to make it even sweeter, the person that runs the program is an uh, IFP alum. It's all in the family, right? Here, here's another example of that. I apologize, the, the pictures are not great quality. But uh, this is an example from Brazil. This is a program that was just approved. You may know that the Brazilian government is sending thousands of students abroad, not for degree programs, but for what they call uh, programa sandwich, sandwich programs, a short-term stay, and they earn their degrees at home. They've, they've uh, supported over the last few years over f about 40,000 students. Some are coming to the UK, I know. Uh, but there hasn't been any effort at affirmative action. And in all of the countries where we work, Brazil has by far the most advanced affirmative action legislation. It does not, however, have the most uh, advanced practice in that area. And you know, you have to keep in mind that Brazil is the largest African country outside of Africa. It has a population that is majority uh, uh, Afro-descendant. And yet, Afro-descendant people are very underrepresented, uh, almost uh, in, with enrollment rates at about half what uh, white Brazilians have. So this is a program that is focused on preparatory training. Uh, this was a very important feature of our program and helped us to get those success rates. Uh, and it was uh, explicitly modeled on the program that we developed to help Brazilian students uh, apply for graduate school. This is, again, at the undergraduate level. But we see this idea that if you really want to break the cycle of disadvantage, you have to give people the conditions to do that. You can't just say, here's a ticket, here's an admission, good luck. Uh, because there are real skill deficits, there are real educational issues that need to be resolved. So very good to see this program uh, in Brazil. Uh, here's one in Chile. Uh, again, this is based on the, this is, uh, this was just announced by President Bachelet in Chile as one of the major innovations of her, uh, uh, of her presidency. She just assumed office for her second term. And the whole idea here is to give students from public schools who had a deficient education, a kind of support and training that will help them to succeed in competitive institutions in higher, in, in higher education. And if you don't have some kind of compensatory mechanism like that, these affirmative action programs are pr pretty much doomed to fail, except for the occasional star student. So we're very happy, and again, we know that there was a direct influence because the organization we worked with in Chile was responsible for the design of this program. Uh, and then to conclude, uh, our program, pretty much as it was for indigenous people in Mexico, and I'll end with Mexico just as I started with Mexico, uh, was picked up by the Mexican government. And there was really a pretty emotional moment when uh, we had the uh, Mexican Secretary of Education and the uh, their uh, higher education agency sit down with the Ford Foundation in Mexico City and uh, thank us for this model. You know, that doesn't happen too often in terms of the, the giant to the north, you know, so we were, we were really very pleased. And less so for the credit that we could take and more obviously for uh, the students that will, will benefit from this. And I can't stress enough <clears throat> to you, and I saw this so many places, the demonstration effect. Even if you have only two or 300 students in a country like Mexico, the prejudice that runs so deep against indigenous people is that you don't expect to see them in prestigious, even Mexican institutions, or certainly international institutions, in highly competitive graduate programs. 
So when, when, and when we started this program, we, we were interested in finding indigenous people who could serve as panelists, selection panelists, right? So that people would be judged by people who looked like them and who had the same experience. You could find them on sort of one hand. We, and, and now, so if you see that we, 10 years later, we have 200, 300, 400 people, this is a, a massive uh, shift and uh, really uh, breaks open a lot of space for people to work in many of the kinds of ways that I've been describing. So I'm going to end there, and the conclusion of all of this is uh, I think it's very, very important uh, to ask a, perhaps a more fundamental question about what we mean by success in international education. It's not so much uh, the kind of traditional arc, people uh, get their fellowship, it's well administered, they enjoy their study experience, they go home and they uh, you know, earn more and have a higher position. That's all wonderful, uh, but if you really want to have uh, the kind of social impact that I believe and many believe is absolutely fundamental for uh, social progress in the world, then I think you have to look at exactly more deeply into the kinds of transformational processes that you see uh, these kinds of students engaged in. Thank you very much.